وأقولوا في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد In today, inshallah ta'ala's session on the ongoing series where we were speaking about um, Ahkamul Kasb, rulings regarding earning. Today, inshallah ta'ala, today's halaqah, today's series or today's gathering, I want to speak about prohibited elements in Islamic finance. Prohibited elements in Islamic finance. Al-Buyu'u al-Manhiyu anha shara'ad. The reason why I chose to speak about that is because the prohibited elements in Islamic finance are restricted. We know it. It's easy. It can be spoken about. Then what is permissible? Because what is allowed is far greater and bigger than that which isn't allowed. So wisdom calls to speaking about that which is restricted and limited and to discuss that. What does the word al bayr mean? What is the definition of al bayr Because that's the term that we're speaking about. al buyu'u al manhiyu anha shar'an. So what does the word al bayr mean? And so today, inshallah ta'ala, I might be slightly technical, but we need this in order to speak about other types of transactions that are done in our modern time that people do and use. And if you don't understand these principles and you don't comprehend it properly, we will struggle to agree on those rulings later, inshallah ta'ala. So, qawa'id and dawabid, this is principles that will aid you and support you in any type of transaction that you're ever going to do, today you're going to learn why is it haram. But again, principles. And principles are what you bring back everything else to. So you might have one principle and under that might fall under it maybe even a hundred types of suwar. A hundred different forms of buying and selling might fall under that one principle. Okay? So what does the word al-bay'u mean? Al-bay'u, it means as Imam al-Nawawi, rahimahullah, the great Shafi'i scholar, this great Shafi'i jurist said, he said, al-bay'u naqlu al-milki ila al-ghayri bi thamanin wa shira'u qabooluh. Nawawi, rahimahullah, he said, bay' means to pass over. It is to pass over. It is to give to another individual the ownership of something with a price. That's what bay'ah means. It's to what? It is to pass over that which you own. It's yours. You own it. And you're passing it over to someone and it's based on a price. Meaning, you give me this much money and this is the product that you want. وَالشِّرَاءُ قَبُولُهُ And Nawawi explained what the word shira means. Shira is the one who is accepting it. And the bay' is the one who is selling it. And they are slightly interchangeably used. So bay' means to sell your ownership of something. You're giving it to someone else on a price. And a shira means it's to accept it. That's the statement of Imam Nawawi rahimahullah. And we're going to take that even though there are other defini definitions out there, but we will just take this one for now, inshallah ta'ala. What is the wisdom? Second point. So the first point was the definition of al bayah We know what the definition of al bayah means, right? The second point. Hikmatul al bayah What is the wisdom in al bayah What is the 
wisdom in al-bayah. Our religion, what you have to understand is there are wisdoms, not wisdom, but wisdoms, plural, in legislations. Nothing is legislated without a wisdom. Everything Allah legislated subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is a wisdom behind it. And sometimes we know what the wisdom is. And sometimes we don't know what the wisdom is. And because we don't know the wisdom, it doesn't mean there is no, there is no wisdom. So we know the wisdom in the legislation of Al-Bayah. There are over 60 plus wisdoms in buying and selling. I am only going to mention uh, one or two, two inshallah ta'ala. The first one is, everyone is in need of what is in the possession of someone else. We need that which is in someone else's hand. And Islam allowed us to take the ownership of that thing in that person's hand without force or humiliation. Force is robbing the person from it and humiliation is begging for it. So Islam legislated a third option. Without force being involved and without any humiliation being involved, you can take the ownership of this thing and that is why Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala said in the ayah, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, those of you who believe, la ta'kulu amwalakum, do not eat each other's wealths. Baynakum bil batili, don't eat each, don't take and consume one another's wealth and one, other, one another's belongings unjustly. Illa an takuna tijaratan, unless it is a business based on mutual consent. إِلَّا أَن تَكُونَ تِجَارَةٍ عَنْ تَرَاضٍ مِّنْكُمْ I said, that's bayah. Because taking it from someone forcefully, it goes against mutual consent. And also, humiliating yourself doesn't come with the form of mutual consent because no one likes to humiliate themselves. Okay? So the Sharia has set bayah for that wisdom. I can take what is in your hand without me forcing it take, to take it out of your hand and without me having to humiliate myself. I buy it from you with honor. That's the first wisdom. And before I move on to the second one, some scholars, they wrote books on that first wisdom. Like the great Indian scholar, Shah Waliullah Dihlawi Rahimahullah. He has a kitab called Hujjatullah al Baligha. Shaykh Shah Waliullah Dihlawi, the great Indian scholar. He mentioned a chapter in where he speaks about Mahasim al Islam, the excellence in his, of Islam, and how Islam is for every time and every place, and in every situation, Islam brings a solution. And in there, he mentions how Islam has brought about good in terms of buying and selling, and he speaks about it there. And also, the great Hanafi scholar, Al Bukhari al Hanafi, not Al Imam al Bukhari, but another Imam who's from the same land as Al Imam al Bukhari who was a Hanafi scholar, he also uh, speaks about it, uh, the, that this falls under the Mahasin al-Islam. The second wisdom of why uh, Islam legislated buying and selling is it can be a means to enter paradise. Buying and selling, it's a means to enter Jannah. If the individual who is involved in the trade has an intention and his intention is to uplift harm and hardship from others it can be a means to enter Jannah and it falls under the hadith of مَن نَفَسَ عَمْ مُؤْمِنٍ كُرْبَةً مِنْ كُرَبِ الدُّنْيَا نَفَسَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ كُرْبَةً مِنْ كُرَبِ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ وَاللَّهُ فِي عُونِ الْعَبْدِ مَا كَانَ الْعَبْدُ فِي عُونِ أَخِيهِ the Prophet said, anyone who relieves from a Muslim hardship of this worldly life, Allah will relieve from you the hardship of the Day of Judgment, the Day of Resurrection. The relief, Allah will relieve from you the hardship and the burdens of that day because you uplifted from a human what? You uplifted from a human a hardship that they were going through. And if you come with that intention when you're buying and you're selling, 
you can actually get rewarded for it and it can be a means to Jannah. Especially if you have the quality of being an individual who's lenient and generous in your buying and your selling. وَلِذَلِكَ الْإِمَامُ Bukhari rahimahullah, The great Imam whose book we consider to be the most authentic book after the Qur'an, he has a chapter in his Sahih. And he said, بَابُ السُّهُولَةِ وَالسَّمَاحَةِ فِي الشِّرَاءِ وَالْبَيْعِ Chapter. One should be lenient and generous when buying and selling. Al-Imam al-Bukhari says, بَابُ the chapter, السُّهُولَةِ وَالسَّمَاحَةِ فِي الشِّرَاءِ, في الشراء وَالْبَيْعِ Being lenient and generous when buying and selling. That one should try to be lenient and generous when buying and selling. And Al-Imam al-Bukhari, under that chapter, he brought the statement of the Prophet ﷺ where the Prophet said, رَحِمَ اللَّهُ رَجُلًا May Allah have mercy upon one. سَمْحًا إِذَا بَاعَ وَإِذَا اشْتَرَى وَإِذَا اقْتَضَى May Allah have mercy upon a person who is lenient in the buying. And he buys and he takes his lenient. Oh, when he's selling, sorry. When he's selling, he's lenient. When he's buying and he's taking a product from someone, he's also lenient. And even when he is demanding for his wealth, he's borrowed a people money. When he asks for it, he makes sure that he's also lenient and generous. He gives people a, a, a longer time. Well, Imam al-Bukhari chaptered another chapter in his Sahih, where he chaptered it and he called it, Babu man anvara mu'siran. The chapter of who allows time for the one who is burdened. In other words, you gave wealth to someone. And so then what you do is, you say to the individual, give it to me when you can. I will not burden you for it. And an Imam al-Bukhari, straight after that, what did he bring? He brought the story of the man. The Prophet said, كَانَ تَاجِرًا There was a man, there was a merchant, يُدَانِ nasa. He used to lend money to the people. فَإِذَا رَأَى مُعْسِرًا and whenever he saw his debtor, the person who took the money and the wealth from him, when he saw him, he was strained. And it was hard on him to pay back. And his circumstances wasn't as good. What he would say is, فَإِذَا رَأَى مُعْسِرًا قَالَ لِفِتْيَانِ He would say to his slaves, let go of this person. تَجَاوَزُ عَنْهُ Let go of him, leave him. لَعَلَّ اللَّهَ There may be a possibility أَنْ يَتَجَاوَزَ Allah may forgive us. Let this man go. His situation isn't bright. He doesn't have the wealth to pay us back now. Let's leave him. Allah may let us go in the day of judgment. And the narration mentions, so Allah forgave him. So this man, through his bay'ah, because we're going to learn, borrowing people money falls under bay'ah. And ahkamul mu'amalat. He earned a place in Jannah. And Allah forgave him subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't belittle your buying and your selling. The Prophet said it, Rahim Allah, may Allah have mercy upon a person. Samhan ila ba'a. When he buys, he's just a simple person. Wa ida shtara wa ida qtada. And when he sells, he's a simple person. And when he borrows, he's, well, he's a simple person. And when he gives back wealth, he's also a simple person. He's just an easy going person. He's not a complicated person. This is a means to Jannah. Okay, it's a what? It's a means to Jannah. Al-Imam Ibn Hajar, rahimahullah, when he brought this, Bukhari brought this hadith in his sahih, he mentioned a benefit I liked about this man who used to borrow, who used to lend money to the people. He mentions that some of the narrations show that this man never did any other khair except this. No other good he did. Never did this man come with any other khair. Some of the riwayat mentioned, except this. And Ibn Hajjah rahimahullah commented on it. And he said the following. He said, وَفِي الْحَدِيثِ الْبَابِ وَالَّذِي قَبْلَهُ أَنَّ الْيَسِيرَ مِنَ الْحَسَنَاتِ إِذَا, إذا كَانَ خَالِصًا لِلَّهِ كَفَّرَ كَثِيرًا مِنَ السَّيَّاتِ أما كُفِّرَ كَثِيرًا مِنَ السَّيَّاتِ And the hadith in this chapter, Ibn Hajjah is saying, and the hadiths in the previous chapters 
I mean, the hadith in this chapter and the one before that, he said, it shows hasanat, small righteous deeds that you do, and if you do it with sincerity, you may be forgiven for a lot of wrongdoings that you've come with. Small good, big intention, a lot of your sins and your shortcomings might be forgiven for you. So this is the second wisdom in why bay'ah was legislated. Because it can be a means for you to enter Jannah. And Allah mentioned that in the Quran, the one who is simple when he lends money to others, Allah said about him, وَإِن كَانَ ذُو عُسْرَةٍ فَنَاظِرَةٌ إِلَى مَيْسَرَةٍ That one should try, if he, if he borrows people wealth and he gives them money, that he's, he looks at the easy way for people. Now we're going to go into the third point, inshaAllah ta'ala. What was the first point that we spoke about? The definition of al bayah The second point that we're going to speak about is, oh sorry, the second point that we spoke about was what? The wisdom of bayah And I only mentioned two. There are more than that, but I only stuck with those two. Now I'm going to go into the third one, which is ruling of al bayah What's the ruling of al bayah Is it permissible? Is it not? There is a unanimously agreed upon principle in our religion. If you open a fiqh book today, okay, all of you guys, if you open a fiqh book today and you want to study fiqh, you will realize that the scholars, they categorize the fiqh books into two chapters. And if we break it down, we can say four chapters. But if we bring it together, we can say two chapters. What are the two chapters? Ibadat. The first chapter of fiqh books are all ibadat. So they talk about at tahara first. And the reason why they talk about at tahara is because the chapter after that is going to be what? As-salah. The chapter after at tahara is what? It is as-salah. And the qa'idah is ma la yatimu al-wajibu illa bihi fahuwa wajib. Salah cannot be done unless you're in a state of purity. So it became a necessity for them to discuss tahara. So that's why they bring tahara in there. And then within tahara, they start with the chapter of water. Because... The thing that you purify yourself first of all is with what? It's water. So scholars, they, they, they put this down in this sequence for a reason. And then once you study a tahara, what do you go to? You go to a salah, and then you go to a sawm, and then a zakat, and then a hajj. Ibadat is over now. You see? Ibadat is what? It is over. The four pillars of Islam. Islam pillars are how many? Five. La ilaha illallah is studied in the tawheed. So they don't bring it in fiqh books. They speak about the four pillars of Al-Islam. As-Salah, Al-Zakah, as sawm and Al-Hajj. But before Salah, they had to mention Al-Tahara because Salah cannot be done without Al-Tahara. So those are the five chapters that you take in what? In uh, Al-Ibadat, in the chapter of Ibadah. The scholars, they then unanimously agreed upon that Ibadah, Al-Aslu fil Ibadat al manah that the default position regarding ibadat is that you can't do anything unless it's prescribed. Unless the legislator, Allah Azza wa Jalla, and his messenger, they prescribe it for you. Meaning you can't do anything in salah, zakah, salm, al-hajj. You can't. Unless you have what? Unless you have a delil. Unless you have a what? Unless you have an evidence for it. Are we all together? And then the second chapter that starts, I mean the second book that starts after that is called Al-Mu'amalat. If you worshipped Allah, you study, you, your relationship with Allah has become strong and you come with ibadah, what's the second thing that you need to have? Relationship with the, with the people. Mu'amalat is your relationship with the, with the people. And the scholars then unanimously agreed that the mu'amala, mu'amalat, Default position is permissibility. وَالْأَصْلُ فِي الْمُعَامَلَاتِ الْجَوَازِ أَمَا الْإِبَاحَ That the default position when it comes to mu'amalat is that it's permissible. Unless there comes an evidence that proves otherwise. So if we find two people here, they are discussing a transaction. They are discussing a type of transaction. The one on the right is saying, it's permissible. And the one on the left is saying what? It's not permissible. It's impermissible. 
who needs to provide the evidence? The one who's saying is what? It's impermissible. Because the one who's saying it's permissible, he's upon the default position. He doesn't have to provide evidence because every type of transaction by default, it is permissible until proven what? Until proven otherwise. Are we all together? Which is what the usuliyin call al-istishab, biqa' ma kan ala ma kan. It's the default position. So what we say here is, buying and selling, the ruling for it is that it's permissible and it's allowed unless there comes an evidence that doesn't allow it. So this qa'idah, you need to know it. وَلِذَلْكَ شَيْخُ الْإِسْلَامِ بِنُ تَيْمِيَ He said, فَإِنَّ الْمُسْلِمِينَ إِذَا تَعَاقَدُوا بَيْنَهُمْ عُقُودًا وَلَمْ يَكُونُوا يَعْلَمُونَ لَا تَحْرِيمَهَا وَلَا تَحْلِيلَهَا فَإِنَّ الْفُقَهَاءَ جَمِيعُهُمْ فِي مَا أَعْلَمُهُ يُسَحِّحُونَهَا Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah said what I just mentioned. That if the Muslims are having or the Muslims are doing a type of transaction, a type of buying and selling, the Muslims are doing it. And they don't know whether it's halal or haram. They don't know. The fuqaha, the jurists, all of them, they permit that transaction. Because they hold that the default position is that every type of transaction is permissible until proven otherwise. Are we all together? And the evidence for that is, the evidence for that is, قوله تعالى الذين يأكلون الربا لا يقومون إلا كما يقوم الذي يتخبطه الشيطان من المس ذلك بأنهم قالوا إنما البيع مثل الربا وأحل الله البيع وحرم الربا وأحل الله البيع Allah permitted al-bay'ah. The word wa'ahalla Allahu al-bay'ah, the alif al-lam in there, there's a dispute amongst the fuqaha, amongst the mufassirin, and also the fuqaha, and even the nuhat, the grammarians. What is the meaning of wa'ahalla Allahu al-bay'ah? Alif al-lam, al-bay'ah, the alif al-lam. Is it istighraqiyah? Does it mean all of the types of bay'ah are permissible? Or is it not? That which we, we hold is that this al-bay' is amun makhsus. It is general al-bay' meaning all of the types of spying and selling are permissible, are, are permissible and except the ones that we're going to mention today. These are the only ones that go out. Any other buying and selling is what? It is permissible. The ones that we're going to mention today, what took it out is external evidences. Okay, so this is called what? Amun? Amun Mahsus. Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, He permitted all types of bay'ah. Also, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, He said, Al bayyani bil khiyani ma lam yatafarraqa. The buyer and the seller have the option to cancel or to confirm a type of transaction. That again shows us buying and selling is what? That it's permissible. We've now spoken about the third pillar. I'm at the third point. How many points did we mention? The definition of al bayah We've done that. The second one was what? The wisdom of buying and selling. We also spoke about the ruling of buying and selling. What is the ruling? Permissibility until proven. Until proven otherwise. Now I want to go into a fourth point, which is pillars of al bayah Arkanul al bayah Buying and selling stand on pillars, particular pillars. The pillars that they stand on are three pillars. Buying and selling stand on how many pillars? It stands on three pillars. The first pillar is as-sigha. As-sigha means the manner in which these two people are buying and selling from one another. The manner. For instance, saying to the person, I sell this product to you. And the other person saying, I accept. What do the fuqaha call? Al-ijab wal qabul buying and someone saying i've accepted from what you've given to me just like marrying a woman the willy and the girl's guardian will say to the man i will marry you off to my daughter fulana binti fulan and i'm going to marry you off to her with these conditions that you her dowry is this much and he says things and then he says to the individual, Aqabilta, did you accept what I just said? And the person says, What? Qabiltu, I accept. Walidalika, marriage falls under mu'amalat. It's a type of transaction. So there's a sirah. 
Okay, there's a what? There's a sira. Sira meaning a way that it's done. The second pillar is al aqidan al aqidan are the two parties. The two parties. Um, the two parties are the two individuals. The one who's buying and the one who's selling. The one who's buying and the one who's selling. There are conditions also except uh, place for them. There has to be sanity. They have to be both sane. Okay? They have to, be re they have to reach age of puberty. And they ha the other person has to be pleased with taking the transaction and the other. Both, they, has to, they have to be pleased with each other. Okay? Again, there's exceptions that can happen here. Like, can a little child go and buy milk for his mom or sugar from the corner shop? Is it accepted or not? That's, a, that's not what we're talking about now. That is permissible. And also, can a transaction happen if a court see the obligation that a particular individual is not paying his debt and he has the money and he's choosing not to pay, that some of his products get taken from him forcefully and then the court sell his product, okay? And then the money that's made is paid from towards the, the people that he's taken the wealth from. Is this transaction done? Is it permissible because this person wasn't pleased with his car being sold or his again of course it is because the consensus of the scholars but again we're not talking about that today inshallah the third pillar is the one we're going to focus on today which is al ma'qudu alayhi al ma'qudu alayhi is the the item which is traded the item and the product which is traded for example uh, money for a product. This is the one that we're going to focus on today, the third pillar. We're not going to talk about the two, two first two ones and how they work. We are going to focus on the item that's going to be sold. Is it halal or is it haram? Okay. We're going to be talking about what the selling and the buying is happening on. This is what we want to speak about in today. And I don't think we will, be, we will be able to finish it all today. We might have to finish it off, inshallah ta'ala, next week, inshallah ta'ala, this particular point. A lot, another point that I want to mention before I go in, and that is ruling on studying al bayah This is the fifth point, right? This is the fifth point, or the fourth point? This is the fourth one, ha. The, f huh? the first one was the definition, the second one was the wisdom, the third one was the ruling, and the fourth one was the pillars, the arkan, and the fifth one now is the ruling on studying bayah. The scholars, they mention studying bayah is not obligatory. Individual obligation I'm referring to. It is not fardu ayn. What is it? Fardu kifaya. Ahkamu al learning it, is fardu kifaya, generally speaking. Unless the person goes forward and wants to buy and sell, then it becomes an individual obligation. Are we all together? Originally, we won't say to every individual, you have to learn ahkamu al No. But if the person goes forward, and he wants to do a business, and he wants to sell, then it becomes an individual obligation which he or she have to, has to learn. وَلِذَلِكَ الْإِمَامُ النَّوَوِيُّ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهِ He transmitted the statement of Imam al haramain Abi Ma'ali al-Juwayni and Imam Abi Hamid al-Ghazali, which are the two fuqaha of the Shafi'i Manhab. Nawawi, when he transmitted their statement, he brought that he, their statement and he said, بَلْ يُقَالُوا يَحْرُمُ الْإِقْدَامُ عَلَيْهِ إِلَّا بَعْدَ مَعْرِفَةِ شَرْطِهِ That it's haram for a person to go forward in buying and selling إِلَّا بَعْدَ مَعْرِفَةِ شُرُوطِهِ Except after learning the conditions for buying and selling. You have to know the shurut. You need to know the prerequisites. وَلِذَلِكَ عُمَرَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنُهُ What did he say? He said, لا يبيع في سوقنا إلا من قد تفقه في الدين. Umar رضي الله عنه said no one should trade in our markets 
except one who has understanding of the religion. And he's referring to this particular chapter of Bayah. Don't come to our markets and try to sell and to buy if you don't know the Ahkamul Bayah. And Umar in another wedding he said, Waqa'a fi riba sha'am aba. That person will fall into riba whether he likes it or not. If you don't learn the Ahkamul Bayah, you will fall into riba whether you like it or not. And some people they say, brother, Wallahi, I did this business trading for a long time. My intention was good. I didn't intend the evil. What should I do in this situation? The qa'idah according to the scholars is وَحُسْنُ maqsad لَا يُبَرِّرُ سُوءَ الْفِعْلِ A good intention does not rectify an evil, an evil action. Remember that principle. حُسْنُ maqsad A good intention does not justify and it cannot rectify an evil action. So sometimes you, say, you tend to see a person who has a business and has built an empire, not just that it's got companies now, and the company is floating on riba. Now what can he do? He didn't intend evil. But right now, this business can't just carry on. In the Sharia, there has to be some way to rectify it. it has to, something has to be done here. So before you go forward in buying and selling, learn the ahkam, ahkam al bayah. Learn at least the basics. Learn at least what? At least the basics. And if you are suffering from comprehending it, then at least have on your board a person of great knowledge who can be referred to. A person that can be what? You can refer to and you can question and you can ask. Because what you tend to find is people, they have an advisory board. Members who they go back to when they want to invest in a particular venture. صح? They have, they have advisors. They go back to and they question them and they say, that, shall we invest in this business? And they look at the risks and the profits and they look at the profit margin and they, and they come back to them and say, yep, it's good, invest. And this is the turnover you're going to get. This is the gross profit. This is the net profit. صح? The same thing is what you need when it comes to what? The halal and the haram. Now I'm going to move on to the topic at hand, inshallah ta'ala. Okay, now those five were just our introduction. Now we're going to go into Subul Mawduh. We're now going to go into the body, the discussion, which is what are the prohibited elements in Islamic finance? I don't think I will be able to do all of it. As I said, I'm going to do some and I'm going to leave the rest for, for uh, next week, inshallah ta'ala. But I reassure you all, if you understand this class and next week's class, if you understand it properly, every single bay that you ever hear that haram will not leave what I mentioned today. It goes under one of these. Okay? Prohibited types of tradings are five. Any type of bayah, any type of transaction that you hear, this is haram. The fuqah say this bayah is haram. It goes back to one of these five. And there is no other ones that can be added to it. Okay? The first one is something that is impermissible and it's haram in and within itself. This, this thing itself is haram. And I'll give you good examples for it, inshallah ta'ala. Just first of all, write all the five. And then we're going to go over each and every one of those five. The first thing is that which is haramun and it's muharramun bi'ayanim, the ayn of this thing. This thing itself is haram. You're not allowed to buy it or sell it. The sharia doesn't allow it. And those are six things. They're what? Six things that are haram to buy and sell itself. Alcohol. Pig. Corpse. An animal that wasn't slaughtered properly to sell it or buy it. Idols. Dog. And blood. Each one we're going to stand over and take the rulings and the discussions regarding it. So point number one is what? 
things that are muharram, they are haram in and within themselves. And there are six things that the Sharia mentioned. The first one is alcohol. Whether you both agree with one another, whether you're both happy with each other, whether it doesn't matter. The thing itself is haram. You can't trade this. Okay? It's one, alcohol. Two, it's a pig. Three, corpse. And a corpse, we call it an animal that did not get a shar'i slaughtering. Okay? The fourth one is idols. You can't sell or buy idols. And we're going to talk about how Harry Potter and all of that fall under there as well, inshallah. For number five, dogs. You can't buy or sell a dog. What about if the dog is a trained dog and I need it for my, for my farm? We'll come to that. And number six is blood. Does hijama fall under there? We'll come to that as well, inshallah. These six are haram in and within themselves. They ayan you can't buy or sell. The second thing, the second thing is the presence of ambiguity. The reason why it's haram is the presence of ambiguity. It's a, this trading was made haram not because this thing is haram. No, no, no. There's nothing wrong with the thing. The thing is good. But there's ambiguity in it. It's what the fuqaha call bay'ul gharar. Bay'u? Bay'ul gharar. And we'll speak about that inshallah. Ta'ala. Number three is a bay which is a bay that has in it there is harm in it. This type of transaction brings about harm. What does that mean? What, can you give examples? We'll come to that. Each one we're going to stand over. This one is wujud al The reason why it's haram is because there's what? There's harm present. Number four is that which it has in it riba. Or it leads to riba. It has riba in it, or it's going to what? Lead to riba. And we'll speak about what that means, inshallah ta'ala. The fifth and final one is something that the bay' is haram because of the place and time. Maybe after the adhan of Jum'ah, or place meaning in the masjid you can't buy or sell. We'll come to those examples as well in great details. Any type of bay' that is muharram, that is manhiyun anha, it falls under those one of those five. Okay? Nothing else. Let's go over the first two today, inshallah ta'ala, and we leave the rest for next week, inshallah ta'ala. So let's take the first one, which is the product is prohibited in its essence. So number one is what? The product and the item is prohibited in what in its in its essence. And how much did we say? How many of them are they? There are six. Let's stand over the evidence for each one. The first one is alcohol, and it's also uh, dead animals and pigs and idols. صح? The Prophet وسلم, he said in a hadith, alayhi salatu wasalam, hadith Jabir ibn Abdullah, and uh, al Imam al Bukhari and Muslim both narrated. Jabir said this was in the year of the conquest of Mecca. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Inna Allah wa Rasulahu harram bay' al-khabri. Allah and His Messenger, they prohibited what? They prohibited the trade of alcohol. Wal maytati and dead animals. A dead animal is that which has not been slaughtered in the way that the Sharia prohibited, uh, permitted, sorry, and the way that the Sharia sanctioned it hasn't been slaughtered in that manner. We consider that to be a dead animal. Okay? Or a person cut a portion, a part of the animal, whilst the animal was alive. And then the animal died from that. I'm a, that piece of meat that was cut from the animal, even if the animal didn't die, 
it's still considered to be what? Haram. The Prophet said in the hadith, مَا قُطْعَ مِنَ الْبَهِيبَةِ وَهِيَ حَيَّةٌ فَهِيَ مَيِّتَةٌ That which has been cut from the animal whilst it was alive, it is considered to be what? A corpse or a dead animal's meat. You're not allowed to do that. So, khamar, the Prophet mentioned it in that hadith. The second thing that the Prophet mentioned here in this hadith is what? Dead animals. The third thing that the Prophet mentioned in this hadith was wal uh, khinzir. And the khinzir is the pig. The Prophet prohibited it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wal asnami. And the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what did he prohibit? The idols, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Faqila ya Rasulullah, the Prophet, he was then asked, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, Ara'ayta shuhum al maytati. What about, what about the, the fat that's taken from the dead animal? What about that? Why did the Sahabas ask that? Fa'inna yutla biha sufun. Because they use the fat of the animals to grease their boats. They use it for the greasing of the, of the boat. So we won't eat it, but all we want to do is just to grease it with the boat and we can use it for other things. Is it permissible in that regard? وَيُدْهَنُ بِهَا الْجُلُودِ And also, people use it for lights. They make candles out of it. فَقَالَ لَهُ وَيُسْتَصْبَحُ بِهَا النَّاسُ فَقَالَ لَا The Prophet said, no. هُوَ حَرَامُ Pay attention. They're not going to just eat it. Even other ways of benefiting from it, the Prophet said it's haram. And then ثُمَّ قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, قَاتَلَ اللَّهُ الْيَهُودَ May Allah's curse be upon the Jews. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَمَّا حَرَّمَ شُحُومَهَا وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَى He prohibited from the Jews and made it illegal for them. The dead corpse and the meat was made haram from them. جَمَلُوهُ What they did was, they melted it. ثُمَّ بَاعُوهُ فَأَكَلُوا ثَمَنَهُ and then they sold it in the market and the money that they used, so they benefited from it in another way. It was made haram from them. They should have abandoned it and left it. But what they did was hila. So they melted the fat. They took it to the market. They sold it. They made money out of it. Because uh, when something is made haram from you, the qa'ida is what? إِنَّ اللَّهَ إِذَا حَرَّمَ شَيْئًا حَارَّحَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ إِذَا حَرَّمَ شَيْئًا If Allah prohibits something from you, also what is made haram from you is what? The money that can be made out of it. It's made haram from you. So, and it's also what the ayah, وَعَلَى الَّذِينَ هَادُوا حَرَّمْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ كُلَّ ذِي ظُفُرْ وَمِنَ الْبَقَرِ وَالْغَنَمِ حَرَّمْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ شُحُمَهُمَا إِلَّا مَا إِلَّا مَا حَمَلَتْ ظُهُرُومَا أَوْ الْحَوَايَا أَوْ مَخْتَلَطَ بِنَا أَوْ مَخْتَلَطَ بِعَض Ibn al-Qayyim said something very powerful regarding this hadith. He said, فَاشْتَمَلَتْ هَذِي الْكَلِمَاتِ These words of the Prophet ﷺ, meaning prohibiting the alcohol, the pig, the corpse, and the idols. Ibn al-Qayyim said something very powerful. He said, فَاشْتَمَلَتْ هَذِي الْكَلِمَاتِ The prohibiting of these things, it consists of على تحريم ثلاثة أجناس There are three types of categories. From this hadith, what we take from it is the things that are prohibited the reason why they're prohibited is because they fall under three types of categories. Which is what? مَشَارِبَ تُفْسِدُ الْعُقُولِ Substance that you take that harm your brain. Alcohol. وَمَطَاعِمَ تُفْسِدُ الطِّبَعَ And also food that all harms your natural disposition, which is the pig. Eating it, they say that it can harm a person's natural disposition. وَأَعْيَانُ تُفْسِدُ الْأَدْيَانَ And also what? Things that harm your religion, like idols. You buy it, you're giving it to someone else, they're going to buy it and it's going to harm their religion. وَتَدْعُوا إِلَى الْفِتْنَةِ وَالشِّرْكِ And it calls to trials and disbelief and polytheism. So this hadith showed us the reason why these things were prohibited is because of one of these three. They're either going to harm your what? Aqal. Or they're going to harm your natural disposition, your fitrah. Or they're going to harm your what? your religion and the deen came to protect all of those. And nowadays what falls under this is what falls under this that harms people's religion 
is books that have inside it magic and sorcery, which people buy and they read, even if it's a storybook, even if it's a novel, it falls under it. Harry Potter, you name these books, movies that people watch, that they download and they watch, and it has sorcery and magic and etc. in it. Buying it and sell it falls, buying and selling that falls under it falls under the asnam, the idols. Because because of a reason, mushtaraka. There's a illa which is shared between both, which is they both are ayyan tusidu al adyana. ila al fitrati wa shirk. Also, what is prohibited is the blood. The blood is what? It's also prohibited. Um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he prohibited the blood. And you're not allowed to buy and sell blood. But there's two types of bloods that are permissible based on the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uhillat lana maytatani. Two corpses are allowed for us. Wadamani and two types of blood are permissible for us. Fa'amma al maytatani. As for the two types of corpses that are permissible, falhut wal jarad. The two types of uh, dead meat which is permissible for us is the uh, locust and um, the fish. As for the two blood, uh, it is the liver and the spleen. Those two types of blood and also are permissible. Abu Ubaid, which is a great scholar, he added under the blood the hijama, the money that's made from hijama. Abu Ubaid Qasim Salam, he said the hijama, the blood that's made from it, he said it falls under the prohibitions of selling blood. Okay? He said that, rahimahullah. Lakin, Abdullah ibn Abbas and Jumhurul Ulama, the overwhelming majority of scholars, they prove otherwise. And they don't accept that concept, which is the Messenger, alayhi salatu salam, a man. He did for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam what? Hijama. And the Prophet paid the man. Alayhi salatu salam. He paid him. So that's also not a strong uh, opinion. But what a person should leave off is um, making it a job. It's preferred to leave it off as a job, as a profession. Making the hijama a profession. It's best to not do that. Okay? As a profession. And it's also not good to set a price for it. What is good is that whatever the person can give you, take it. Okay? But this doesn't fall under the prohibition of the blood. It doesn't fall under the prohibition of the blood. Um, also, what, are, what is prohibited is dogs. A dog is not allowed. The evidence for that is the hadith of Abu Juhayfa. The hadith of Abu Juhayfa which is narrated in Sunan Sahih al-Bukhari, that the Prophet ﷺ, he prohibited the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet, he forbade the acceptance of the price for a dog. Um, and the blood as well. The hadith mentions both of them. Now, the scholars, they disputed amongst themselves, is it for the uh, every type of dog, or is it specific type of dog. What about if I have a farm and I need a trained dog? And the trained dog, of course, he goes through a training process, a person exerts efforts to teach the dog and they, they want to charge for it. Is it allowed? Um, Al Imam Ibn Hajar, rahimahullah, he says, nahi. He says, nahi tahrimu wa huwa fi kulli kalbin mu'alliman kana aw ghayrahu. Ibn Hajar says the hadith shows from the apparent that it is any type of dog. Because the Prophet didn't say except this dog. And the fact that the Prophet left it general means every single type of dog is not allowed to be brought or sold. Okay? But what about if I really need it? The Hanbali Madhab, as Ibn Qudama said, لا يختلف المذهب في أن البيع الكلب باطل أي كلب كان Ibn Qudama, he said, within the Hanbali Madhab, he said there's no difference of opinion. 
that the buying and the selling of the dog is batil, wherever that dog may be, whether it be a trained dog or not. doesn't matter. Lakin Ibn Hazm said a very good statement of his that I liked. He said, Rahimahullah, وَلَا يَحِلُّ بَيْعُ كَلْبٍ أَصْلًا No one's allowed to sell a dog and make business from that. You're not allowed to. لَا كَلْبَ صَيْدٍ وَلَا كَلْبِ مَاشِيَةٍ Whether that dog is the dog, trained dog or not a trained dog. Doesn't matter. وَلَا غَيْرَهُمَا فَإِنِ الضُرَّ إِلَيْهِ But if a person is in a state of necessity, I need this dog and I can't find anyone giving me this dog, just like that. Someone is saying, I'll give you the dog, but for a price. فَإِنِ الضُرَّ إِلَيْهِ And there's a necessity, you need it. وَلَمْ يَجِدْ مَنْ يُعْطِيهِ إِيَّاهُ فَلَهُ بْتِيَاعُهُ You're allowed to then buy it. I say, okay, how much does it cost? You're allowed to. وَهُوَ حَلَالٌ But it's halal for who? لِلْمُشْتَرِي حَرَامٌ عَلَى الْبَائِعِ It is halal for the one who's buying it, but it's haram for the one who's selling it. Why? كَالْرِشْوَةِ فِي دَفْعِ الظُّلْمِ And he said, this is, a, this is similar to a person whose product and his property has been taken oppressively. Someone's got your land or they've got your house, okay? And they say to you, if you want it back, just give me some money, I'll give it to you. And you have to pay bribery, you have to bribe to get your, your own rights back. Are you allowed to do that? The ulama, they say, you can. This is mine. I won't get it any other, any other way, except I have to pay a bit of money to get my rights. But what is mine that's been taken from me unjustly? I can only get it if I bribe my way through it, okay? Uh, you can. And get what is yours, your house or your property or something has been taken from you. But who is it haram for? The one who's taking the money. The one who's giving it is not haram for him. He said it's the same when it comes to the dog. It is what? It is same when it comes to the dog. And it's also like taking a captive from the people who are, um, they taken a person, a captive. Are you allowed to buy and sell a person? You're not allowed to. But here you have to, you have to buy someone to bring back their freedom because they've been taken oppressively. He said that it's not haram for the one who's buying the person to make him free, but it is haram for the person who's selling it. Um, let's move on to the second thing, inshallah ta'ala. We've mentioned the first type, which was what? Things that are haram in and within themselves. Huh? They, those were the six. Now we're going to go into yeah, bay'ul gharar. The presence of ambiguity. And we're going to conclude with this one, inshallah ta'ala. Um, the Prophet sallallahu he prohibited based on the hadith of Abu Hurairah. The hadith of Abu Hurairah states, and then Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam naha an bay'ul gharari. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he prohibited bay'ul gharar. The hadith of Imam Abu Dawood narrated in his sunan. That the Prophet forbade the transaction which involves ambiguity. It's ambiguous. What does it mean, bay'ul uh, gharar? What does gharar mean? Al Imam al Khattabi, rahimahullah, in his kitab Ma'alim al Sunan, he said, Aslu al gharari huwa ma tuya anka ilmuhu wa khafiya alayka baatinuhu wa sirru. He says the foundation of ambiguity, a bay'ul gharar, is when its knowledge is covered and its inner reality and secrets are hidden. You're buying something. You don't know the reality of this thing. Someone is trying to hide something from you and they're giving it to you. Which nowadays, very common when you're selling and you're buying things. You go to a shop, um, especially me when I go to shops and I want to buy books, the books are in covers. And you say to the owner, can I open it? Because sometimes what happens to the books is there are five, six pages which are saved. Okay? Or pages which are missing from the book. Which is a publication mistake. Or sometimes... The book is upside down. Sometimes you see these things. So you say to the owner, can I just, and I've even once I bought a book which it was all blank. The 100 and something page were all blank. So when I went home, it was all blank. So the owner, I have the rights to say, can I open what I'm buying? Okay, I have the rights to say, I want to see what it is. Shaykh al Islam bin Taymiyyah, he defined al gharar as what? Huwa al majhul al aqibah. The word the gharar is when their ending is unknown. You don't know what this thing is going to lead to. He said that in his kitab, Qawa'idul Nuraniya and his Majmu'ul Fatawa. 
But here we have an issue. I want to buy a house. Okay? And the house is built. And of course, I don't know the building and the foundation and the, the bottom foundation of the building. And I don't know how it was built from beneath. Can I say, destroy this whole building so I can see what's under? So I know it indeed. Uh, can I say that? No. Shaykh al Islam ibn al Qayyim, rahimahullah, he said, Falaysa kullu gharrin sababan li tahrib. Not every type of ambiguity is haram. If the ambiguity is simple, it's something very easy. Or it's impossible for the person to go out of it. Meaning a person can't say to you, okay, I'll show you the foundation of this building. He can't because this thing is going to get destroyed and his wealth is going to get destroyed. This does not prevent the factor of the validity of the contract. Okay? So sometimes there is what is known as فقها قول غرر يسير. There is a what غرر يسير, which is there is a small portion of ambiguity. Now I'm going to mention examples of ambiguous transaction. A. One of the, 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 that which falls under بيع الغرر, ambiguous buying and selling is بيع ما ليس ما ليس عندك. Selling that which you do not have. You are selling that which does not belong to you. Um, Hadith Hakim ibn Hizamin, which Al Imam Tirmidhi narrated, he said, Nahani Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam an abi amalay sa'indi. The Prophet he prohibited me, alayhi salatu wa sallam, from selling what was not with me. The Prophet prohibited me. To sell that which is not with me. So you're selling something to a person and you do not have it. You're going to buy it later. Brothers, the principles is what I want you to understand. Later, we're going to talk about Forex, online trading, Bitcoin. All of these things are going to come. But first of all, I want these principles to be understood. And these qawaid. Okay, and how they apply on our modern day buying and selling. So when the class finish, don't interrogate me with questions. I just want to now put down the principles. Everything is coming. It is going to come. I promise you guys. Let's first of all understand these qawaid. And Imam al-Bukhari, who chapter, is, chapter in his Sahih, and he said, Babu qabla an wa ma laysa indak. What I want from it is, wa ma laysa indak. Selling, what is not yours. You don't have it. And why do I keep mentioning the tabwibat of Imam al-Bukhari? Why do I keep mentioning Bukhari's tabwibat? Babu, Bukhari made a chapter in. Because fiqh al-Bukhari fi tarajuli. Bukhari's fiqh is in his chapterings. And Imam al-Bukhari, his fiqh, his view, his opinions are in his chapterings. So when I say to you, Bukhari chapter this in his sahih means this is the opinion of Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah. Are we all together? The second type of Bay al gharar the ambiguous trading or the ambiguous transaction is selling a product before possessing it. And there's a difference between the, fir the first one and the second one. The first one is you don't own it at all. It's not yours, aslan. Like in this one, you own it, but it's about to come to you. It's yours. You bought it. But it hasn't been placed under your what? Under your possession. It's on its way. It's about to come. The delivery people haven't brought it to you. You're selling it. What are you doing? You're selling that which you haven't got in under your, under your possession. Al-Imam Al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, narrated on the authority of Ibn Umar that the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said the following. He said, The buyer of food stuff should not sell it before it has been measured for him. Meaning, don't sell something unless you've brought it into your shelter, unless you brought it into your possession. Is this only specific to food? Because the narration said, 
Abdullah ibn Abbas, he said, وَلَا أَحْسِبُ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ إِلَّا مِثْلَهُمْ Abdullah ibn Abbas, he said, I consider that all types of trading should be done similarly. It's just not food. It can be cars, it can be phones, it can be electronics, it can be anything. If you've bought something, but it hasn't been brought under your possession, don't sell it unless it's under your possession. Okay? But the question here is, what is possession? What does it mean under my possession? What we say is Mas'ala tul qabr, because this is the issue the fuqaha discuss. Al qabr, that's under your possession. What does it mean? This is what goes back to the urf. The concept of what makes something um, under your possession, it goes back to what? It goes back to urf, the custom of the people. The custom of the, the people. Nowadays we have um, storages, warehouse, basket online. It goes into your basket. This is the urf that we understand it of possession. Are we all together, brothers? Um, there's a hadith I want to mention, inshallah ta'ala, which is Abdullah ibn Umar said the following. He said, I brought Oliver. Oliver oil. Abdullah ibn Umar. I brought Oliver oil in the market. فلما استوجبته لنفسي لقي لي رجل فأعطاني به ربحا حسنا فأردت أن أضرب على يده فأخذ رجل من خلفي بذراعي فالتفت عبد الله بن عمر he said I brought olive oil in the market when I became its owner now it's mine I bought it I gave the money I bought it before I can depart and I can leave I'm standing where I bought it I'm still in the place I'm still in the market a man met me, a man saw me, and offered a good profit for it. Maybe Ibn Umar walked away from the place, you know, but this man couldn't be bothered to go and buy it. He said to him, um, I'll give you something better for it. How much does it cost? I'll give you, you got it for that much? I'll give you this much for it. He told Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu a good price for it. And Abdullah ibn Umar saw a good price, profit. He wanted to buy, sell it to the man. As I was willing to sell it, فَأَخَذَ رَجُلٌ مِنْ خَلْفِي بِذِرَاعِي A man grabbed me by the hand here, or here, and he grabbed me. And he said to me, لا تبعه, don't sell it. Like that. And I looked. فَإِذَا هُوَ زَيْدُ بْنُ ثَابِتٍ The man was Zayd ibn Thabit, the noble companion. He said to me, لا تبيعوا حيث ابتعته Don't sell it where you brought it. حتى تحوزه إلى رحلك Until you bring it to your possession. فإن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم نهى because the Prophet prohibited أن تباع السلع حيث تبتع The Prophet prohibited that you buy something and you sell it on the same place that you brought it. حتى يحوزه التجار إلى رحالهم Until you take it back to your until you take it back to your house. Why? Abdullah ibn Abbas explained in Sahih Muslim when he was asked about Ta'us ibn Kaysan, he asked him, the student ibn Abbas said, why is it not allowed? He owns it, he brought it. What's the problem? He said, Ala tarahum yat, ala, ala, he said, ala, in Sahih Muslim, Ala tarahum yatabaa'awna bidhahabi wa ta'ami murja'a. Do you not see that when this person, this individual, buys a product for a hundred, مثلا, a hundred dirhams. He's standing somewhere, someone sold it to him for a hundred dirham. And then he says to the individual, Jazakallah khairin, he takes a product. Without leaving the place, someone else comes and gives it to him for 120. It's similar for a person who took a hundred for 120. Who changed a hundred to a what? Because he had a hundred in the beginning and he left with what? 120 in one place. That's what it's similar to. So, a person has to take it to their possession and then they can sell it. The third type that falls under Bay'ul Gharari is selling a product which is not uh, clear. It's not clear. And it's what's referred to as Bay'ul Sinin and Bay'ul Thunayya. Bay'ul Sinin and Bay'ul Thunayya 
is that a person sells Bay'u sirin is when a person sell, sells something which is completely unknown. For example, a person will say, the crops of my garden or my farm is yours for the following years to come. Years to come. But what is this land going to produce? What is it going to be like? Allahu A'lam, no one knows. Bay'u thunayya is making an unexpected, unknown ex- ex- uh, prediction. For example, a person says to you, I will sell my car to you, however I will use it. And he doesn't state for how long he's going to use it for. We'll stop there inshallah ta'ala. I think this one needs more explanations. And our minds have slightly become fried with these points. Um, so inshallah ta'ala, next week, we'll go back to the third point, which is selling... Uh, the type of bay'u, bay'u sirin and bay'u thuniyya and what it means. Anything that I have said that was wrong or incorrect is from me as shaytan and Allah and his messenger are free from it. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Astaghfiruka wa atubu alayka.